In this video, we'll talk about argument forms and how validity works for them. It's not quite the same way as arguments that are instances of those argument forms. It's not the same kind of validity. Uh, we'll take a little bit of a different approach than Smith takes in the book. And not because he did a poor job or anything, but because this is a, a difficult topic. And I think viewing it from different perspectives will be helpful. So I'll be doing 5.4 and 5.5 at the same time, but kind of reversed. By the way, if you're a long time viewer, You'll notice that the studio looks a lot different. I, I had a good friend of mine, Bryce and Kelso, come over and uh, fix some of the lighting stuff and he did all kinds of crazy stuff. Anyway, so if it looks weird, that's why. Let's consider an argument, argument one, that goes something like this. You did not not pass, therefore you passed. And it's a weird way to put it, you did not pass. But sometimes, you know, like you might be like, I don't know if I passed or not. Well, you did not not pass. And what that means, what that entails, is that you actually did pass. We could symbolize this argument, not not P, therefore P. And this is a valid argument. You know, when we run a truth table for this, whenever P is true, that's going to make the premise not not P true. And the conclusion will also be true because the conclusion is just P. Whenever P is false, the premise is going to be false. So we don't really care what the conclusion is because remember, all validity means is that if the premises are true, then the conclusion has to be true. And looking at this truth table, we see that any kind of argument that is structured like this, exactly like this, is going to be valid as well. So let's say instead of having those P's there, we switch those P's out with L's. And we could say L stands for you like logic. So our new argument, argument two, would be you don't not like logic, therefore you like logic. And since all I've done was switch out P's and L's, the exact same thing happens. So anything that looks like that, anything that's structured exactly that way is going to be a valid argument. Now, one thing we can do here is to sort of abstract the uh, argument structure that these two arguments share. Uh, instead of substituting for P's L's, let's substitute alphas, where alpha is a well-formed formula variable. Remember, when we said well-formed formula variable, what we meant was can stand for any well-formed formula. So instead of uh, not not P, therefore P, we'll have not not alpha, therefore alpha. We'll call this argument form DN for double negation. Now there's something to note here that might seem trivial at first, but as we'll see later on, there are going to be really big implications because of it. When I'm looking at arguments and I run these truth tables, those T's and F's stand for trues and falses. What did true and false mean again? Well, true we defined as uh, accurately reflects the way that reality is. False doesn't accurately reflect the way reality is. Reality is not that way. So Notice then things can only be true or false if they are claiming that reality is some particular way. And we said the only thing that claims that reality is, is a particular way are propositions. Or we just named, you know, propositions are those things which uh, make claims about reality. Um, so propositions are true or false. But notice in these argument forms, we're using well-formed formula variables. Well-formed formula variables are not propositions. They're not making claims about reality. They are representing well-formed formulas. They're representing propositions, right? You could put propositions in place of them. They're, they're, they're sort of placeholders for propositions, but they're not propositions themselves. So technically speaking, they can't be true or false. So although we can run uh, the same exact truth table, for argument one that we do for argument form dn here. The fact that one of them is an argument with propositions, the other is an argument form that doesn't have propositions means that all those t's and f's can't actually stand for trues and falses. They're just t's and f's, right? They're just two different values that, that could mean anything. Now, why is that important? Well, remember that an argument is valid if and only if the premises being true guarantees that the conclusion will also be true, right? Like as long as the premises being true guarantees the conclusion being true, then it's a valid argument. Well, since we don't have any trues or falses here, it's not quite the same for argument forms. They can't be valid or invalid per se. We'll have to make up a totally new term for these, uh, for these argument forms and in the book, Smith comes up with valid star and invalid star. Now, why is that important? What do those 
two terms mean? Well, consider this argument, argument three here. Uh, it's not the case that you didn't pass, therefore you got the high score. And we can symbolize this as a not not P, therefore H, where P stands for you passed just like it did in argument one. Now considering this argument here, uh, this is an invalid argument. You know, if I run the truth table for these, whenever P is true and H is false, we're gonna have uh, a true premise, and there's only one premise here, and a false conclusion, so this will be invalid. Right? It's an invalid argument. And this is an instance of the argument form not not alpha, therefore beta. So when I run an, an identical truth table for, for that argument form, I'm going to get, you know, an invalid star argument form. I know it's going to be identical because all I'm doing is swapping out letters here. Right? I'm swapping out a P for an alpha and an H for a beta. So I know that I'm going to get the same exact kind of truth table here. Um, again, it's going to be invalid star, not just invalid per se. The problem here comes, the reason why we care is because consider arguments one and two. Those are actually also instances of this argument form. How is that possible? Well, remember in reminder 2a, or, or I could, let's even say rule 2a, I don't know. I, I don't remember why I called it a reminder or rule or which one I called it, but let's just say rule 2a, that a uh, the same well-formed formula can replace two different well-formed formula variables. That's okay, that's acceptable in our in, in our scheme here. So if that's the case, then alpha can stand for P and beta can actually also stand for P, right? They can both be replaced by a P and then that will be argument one there. So argument one is an instance of argument form DN and it's also an instance of this other argument form here we can call DN1 just because it's a double negation. Kind of, I don't, it's not really a double negation, it, it, it's an erroneous double negation. But so since it is an instance of both argument forms. We saw that it was a valid argument, but it's an instance of a valid star argument form and an invalid star argument form. That seems kind of like a problem. Not only that, but arguments one through three are also instances of a different argument form, which we could call argument form 1P for one premise. And it looks something like this, alpha, therefore, beta. Now, how are they all instances of this argument form? Well, remember rule one we had was that a well-formed formula variable can be replaced by any well-formed formula, including any sized well-formed formula. It doesn't have to be a basic proposition like P or L or H. It could be if P, then Q or L and H, something like that. It could be any size you want. So. Premise one in all of our previous arguments are double negations, not not P, not not L, not not P. Well, those could be replaced by an alpha. So uh, they are all instances of this. And if you think about it, any argument that has one premise is going to be an instance of this argument form. Why? Because it doesn't matter how complicated the premise gets, doesn't matter how complicated the conclusion gets, you can always replace that that premise with just the well-formed formula variable alpha, right? The premise has to be a well-formed formula. It has to be a proposition of, of whatever size, doesn't matter the size, but it can always be replaced by just one well-formed formula variable. So they're all instances of this. And this is an invalid star argument form. If you run the tables, you know, alpha can be true when beta is false, and that gives us a true premise and a false conclusion. So now because of rules one and two a arguments can be instances of these more general argument forms. Now I'm going to introduce a, a new concept here that is not mentioned in the book, but uh, we'll call it closest argument form. And what I mean by that is, you know, an argument can be an instance of a bunch of different kinds of argument forms. However, there's gonna be one that's gonna be structurally identical to it. And we can get that argument form if we deny rules one and two way. And I'm not saying that there's any problem with those rules in general, but to get our closest argument form, to get something that's structurally identical, instead of rule one, we'll say, 
that you can't put anything bigger than a basic proposition, you can't replace with a Wolfram formula variable. So you can replace P with a Wolfram formula variable alpha, but you can't replace not not P because that is a complex proposition. That's not a basic proposition. And also reject rule 2A. Anytime we replace a basic proposition with a well-formed formula variable, uh, everywhere else throughout that argument, we replace it with that same kind of, of uh, basic proposition with the same well-formed formula variable. So if we replace a P with an alpha, then later on in the argument, we see a P, we also replace it with an alpha. In other words, looking at argument one, uh, the argument form double negation DN would be its closest argument form. Uh, the other argument form that we looked at, that that will be a, a more general argument form. It's one that it shares with argument three, but notice the argument three does not share our argument form DN with one and two. So it's a more general, it's more broad uh, argument form, the second one. Argument form DN's a, a little bit more specific, and in these cases, it's the closest to the structure of those arguments one and two that we can get. So when I look at the truth table for this argument form DN, it's going to be identical with arguments one and two for the same reason we said before, is because we're really just swapping out letters, and that's all we're doing. We're keeping everything else consistent. So for that reason, I can know that if my closest argument form is invalid star, then the argument that's in the instance of will also be invalid. If my closest argument form is valid star, then the arguments that are instances of that closest argument form are also gonna be valid. Then why take note of this in the first place? Well, let's check out argument one one more time. We have not not p, therefore p. It's an instance of argument form dn, not not alpha, therefore alpha, and also an instance of argument form dn1, not not alpha, therefore beta. Argument form dn1 is a little bit more general. And, and notice what happens when we get a little bit more general. We sort of get new possible combinations here. When we had our closest argument form here, every time that that alpha was true, you know, in that premise it was true, well, so it had to be true in the conclusion. We couldn't have the alpha be true in the premise and false in the conclusion. But now we have this more general argument form and we have the alpha true in the premise. Well, now we can have beta true or false. So we've added more possible combinations and therefore we, we get an invalid star argument form. So then the closer that we get to our closest argument form, the more potential combinations are gonna be excluded. And that's a good thing because remember that every argument with only one premise is an instance of that argument form 1P where we have alpha therefore beta, which is an invalid star argument form. If, if it were in the case that, you know, getting it closer to the closest argument form cuts off these, these, potential, um, these potential invalidators, then we would never have a valid argument with one premise. And then you could run the same exact thing for arguments with two premises, right? Alpha, beta, therefore, gamma. I always want to say Charlie, alpha, beta, Charlie, because that alpha, bravo, Charlie, because uh, the Air Force, I don't know, man. If it's the case that an argument can be an instance of a, an invalid star argument form, but still be valid, why would we take note of this? Why would we care then? Well, one reason is because that some argument forms are tempting. Some argument forms look really attractive and you think that they're gonna be valid star and you find out that they're invalid star. And, and that's important in, in that you, you won't be accepting those argument forms just right off the bat. So that's one possible reason. Another possible reason though is even, even though an invalid star argument form can have an instant that's valid, uh, the reverse isn't necessarily the case. An argument form that's valid star cannot have an argument instance that is invalid. Now it'd be good because if we see that it's in, it's a valid star argument form, it means anything we generate that's an instance of that will know is valid. So consider argument five here. It's not, not the case that you passed and got the high score. Therefore you passed and got the high score. I, this is convoluted, but just follow me here for the sake of this argument or the sake of, the, of this example. Uh, so this would be symbolized not not, both P and H, therefore both P and H. Now this is an instance of the argument form DN. It's a double negation where alpha is replaced by the complex proposition P 
P and H. So when I do that, uh, I know that that argument form uh, DN is valid star. But I might worry, I might get concerned here, but do I know that this new instance, because it's a little bit more complex, do I know that this is gonna be valid, even though it's an instance of a valid star argument form? I can be sure it is, and here's why. Regardless of how complex the proposition is that you're switching out in there for alpha, notice that alpha can just only be two possibilities, true or false, or T or F, right? So not not alpha, therefore alpha, we know that the alpha in the premise being T is going to make the whole premise T, and when that happens, the conclusion alpha is also going to be T, has to be T, and when we, we uh, put an F for that alpha, it's going to make the whole premise false, so we won't care about what the conclusion is. So that means that it doesn't matter how complex the proposition is that you're putting in there for alpha, if that, that complex proposition is true, then the conclusion will also be true. If it's false, we won't care what happens. So we know that that doesn't regard, regardless of how complex that proposition is, we know we're going to have a, a valid argument. So that's kind of nice. If we have at this smaller level, uh, or this more general level, I should say, of argument form, a valid star argument, we know that we can make all kinds of complex arguments with it and they would still be valid as long as they're instances of this one general valid star argument form. Now you may wonder, well, why doesn't it go both ways though? I mean, like, why is it the case that you can be invalid star, but also be valid? But you can be valid star and you can't be invalid. It can't happen that way. This would be because of rule 2B, where we said that if you have two cases of the same well-formed formula variable, you can't replace it with different well-formed formulas. And so what do I mean by that? Um, again, look at argument one here. I could replace P with an alpha in, in premise one or with a beta in, in premise two. Now look at that argument form DN. I, I have an alpha in the premise and alpha in the conclusion. Uh, rule 2b tells me that I can't replace the alpha with a p and the other alpha with an h. If I did that, then I, I would have a, an invalid argument. So I would have uh, the possibility of a valid star argument form, but an invalid argument. But I'm not allowed to do that, right? That's rule 2b disallows me from doing that. So that's why it only goes one way. So I know this is super complicated, right? This is super wacky, but a quick review then, remember that arguments are valid or invalid argument forms, the ones with the well-formed formula variables like alpha and beta, those are not invalid or valid, those are valid star or invalid star. If an argument is valid, then its closest argument form will be valid star and vice versa, right? Uh, if an argument is invalid, then its closest argument form will be invalid star and vice versa. If an argument form is valid star, then any instance of it will also be a valid argument. If an argument form is invalid star, then, and it's not the closest argument form to whatever instance we're looking at, then we're not sure. Uh, that argument could be a valid argument, it could be an invalid argument. I, should, I take that back. There are some cases where an argument form is invalid star and it doesn't have any instances that are valid arguments, but we'll, we'll see that in the exercises here. But just for the most part, if it's an invalid star argument form, then we're not sure. Um, so let's go ahead and do some of these exercises here. 5.4.1 says, for each of the following arguments, show that it's an instance of the form alpha, if alpha then beta, therefore beta, by stating what substitutions of propositions for variables have to be made to obtain the argument from the form, and two, show by producing a truth table for the argument that it is valid. Oh, I don't wanna do the truth tables, but I, I will, just for your sakes. But when I look at one here, P if P then Q, therefore Q, uh, whenever alpha is replaced by P and beta is replaced by Q, you would get argument one here. I'll just go through one through four first, and then I'll do the truth tables for them. Um, I don't have the true tables in front of me, so <laughs> I'll have to do them on the fly. If you replaced alpha with A and B and beta with B or C, then you would get argument, uh, or 
you get number two here, and that would be an instance of that argument form. If you replaced alpha with A or not A, and beta with A and not A, then you would get three here. Uh, if you replaced alpha with if P then not P, and beta with if P then Q and not R, then you would get number four here. One is easy because one is exactly, a, that's the closest argument form for one. So their true tables are gonna look identical, right? When P is true and Q is true, we're gonna have uh, true premises, but the conclusion will also be true. When P is true and Q is false, uh, we'll have true premises, uh, no, I'm sorry, we'll have the second premise will be false. So we won't care what the conclusion is. Conclusion will be false, but we won't care. Uh, when P is false and Q is true, we're gonna have a false premise in, in the first premise. So we won't care about the conclusion. And again, when P is false and Q is false, again, we will have a false premise in, in the, the beginning there. So we won't care what happens. Uh, and, and since we saw that this is a, a valid star argument form, we don't have to go through the argument truth tables for each one of these arguments, but let's do it this way. Cause I don't, I mean, the, the truth tables aren't super fun, but I, I do want, I mean, in case you have these questions, I, I want to be able to, I want you to be able to see it. And if you want me to do it again so that you can see me go through this, I totally understand. Just let me know. Um, but what we're really looking for is any kind of any cases where both premises are true and the conclusion is false and the premise one is only true when both a is true and b is true right and so b is true in when b is true it makes the the consequent in the second premise also true b or c is true when b is true and so that's the only time when we have both premises true. So I look at B or C and uh, whenever B is true, then B or C is true. So the conclusion will be true too. So valid. We know that's a valid argument. Uh, for number three, A or not A is always true, right? Either A, a or not A says something like either A is true or it's false. And uh, so that's always going to be true. Uh, a and not A, however, is a contradiction. So that will never be true. So uh, the only time that we'll have a problem is never because the conclusion will also be false, always be false. So we're good. Number four is kind of weird because we have this if P then not P. And uh, if, if P were, if when we consider P being true, then we're gonna have a contradiction in premise one, right? P is true. That's going to give us also a not P. So we'll have P true and not P true. Can't do that in classical logic. So anytime P is true, I know that premise one is going to be false. What's really weird about conditionals is they can only be false if the antecedent is true and the consequent is false. So when P is false, the antecedent is actually going to be uh, false. And that's going to make that whole uh, conditional true, which is a super weird idea, but... If you're confused about that, go back and check out the video on conditional. It's, it's a confusing idea. So if that's the case, then the P being false in the antecedent for premise one makes that premise true. Now we got to worry about premise two. Is that going to be true? And yes, it will. Because notice like you have, you have like uh, embedded conditionals here, but in both conditionals, if P then not P, and then on the other side, if P then Q and not R, P is false for both of those. So both of those conditionals are true. And then we have the bigger conditional, and that's going to be true in the antecedent and true in the consequent. So we're going to have a true conditional. And then, so we have two true premises, but looking at uh, the, looking at the conclusion, Again, P is false in that first, that antecedent. So that's going to make the conclusion true as well. So the only time we have true premises, we have a true conclusion. Um, that That is basically all of 5.4.1. 5.5.1 exercises 
uh, one one says show by producing a truth table for the following argument form that it is invalid. Actually, it should say invalid star. So bonus points for us. Looking at our, our truth table that we could come up with, uh, there's going to be one line where alpha is T and beta is F. And when that's the case, the premise here will be T and the conclusion will be an F and we'll have an invalid star argument form. So part two says, give an instance of the above argument form that is valid. Show that it is valid by producing a truth table for the argument. The easiest thing you can do is just substitute P for alpha and P for beta, right? And because and, remember, you know, two different well-formed formula variables can be replaced by the same well-formed formula. So that would be P therefore P. And we would have a truth table that has P being true. And when it's true in the, that premise, then it's true in the conclusion. So the premise is true, the conclusion is true. And when it's false, the premise is false, so we don't care about the conclusion at all. So we have a valid argument. Number two says, while it's not true in general that every instance of an invalid argument form, invalid star argument form, is an invalid argument, uh, there are some invalid star argument forms whose instances are always invalid arguments. Give an example of such an argument form. This is what I, I mentioned earlier. I can think of one uh, argument form type I don't know if there are more than one, but um, whenever you, your argument form has a contradiction, so let's take the argument form, we'll call it SC for just straight contradiction. Um, and it looks like alpha, therefore not alpha. And, and there are other argument forms that will produce uh, contradictions like this, but, but could consider this. Anything you throw in there for alpha being true in the premise will, be fal will make a false conclusion. So argument six, P therefore not P. When P is true, the conclusion not P is gonna be false. Uh, also argument seven, P and H. P and H therefore not P and H. Whenever P and H is true, not P and H is gonna be false. So you have a true premise and a false conclusion invalid argument. So doesn't matter what you do it to this argument form, it's going to always result into a contradiction. Anyway, that is all for this video. Interestingly, for the next video, it, it's weird because there's like a really short section, right? And it shows you a few famous argument forms. And what's funny is like in most introduction to logic courses, that that's what you get a lot of, is, are ex those exact things. And they don't teach you like uh, some of these other things that we're learning. So, uh, it, but it's weird, it gets a passing mention and then some argument forms that are, are famous like that aren't even mentioned there. So what I'll do is go, you know, go ahead and check it out real quick. I will go through those argument forms and show you why they're interesting. And then we have, I think one more section and we'll be done with chapter five and ready for chapter six. Chapter six is gonna be fun. Uh, anyway, that's all for this video. I'll see you in the next one.